time having arrived, we call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order. I ask everyone to please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Could I ask everyone to please remain standing for just a moment? Uh, this past week we lost uh, a longtime school department employee, Deborah Carney, and I'd like to ask everyone to observe a moment of silence in her memory. Thank you. <clears throat> Superintendent, would you like the floor for a minute before we yes. start the meeting? You know, I again want to express my condolences to the Carney family. Uh, Deborah Carney worked in Brockton for, I believe, close to 25 years with our food service workers. My sympathy goes out to her family. Uh, those of you might have seen over the holiday weekend that there was a car accident uh, right near the Bourne Bridge. Uh, she was out with uh, a day with her family, and unfortunately, was uh, the car was in an accident and. Uh, Deborah lost her life, and uh, her young granddaughter, 15 years old, I'm told, is still in the hospital. So please keep her young granddaughter also in your prayers. Um, again, our, our sympathies go out to Tom Burke and their staff. You know, they're usually the ones that come forward whenever we have had any kind of tragedy with our members in the district. So hopefully we will have an opportunity to support our food service workers uh, in their time. And, and again, she has been here a long time. I was told, again, you know, I, I, I know the face. But, you know, when you hear that this is the person that always comes forward to do whatever they needed to do, you know, was certainly part of the Brockton Public Schools family. So, again, I express my sympathies to, uh, to all. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Superintendent. So we open each meeting of the Brockton School Committee with hearing of visitors. This is an opportunity for residents to speak directly to the committee, the superintendent, and myself. Uh, there is a three-minute time limit on your remarks. We take all matters under advisement. We do have actually three names here signed in together. Lizette Baptista, Jatana Blaufelder, and Katie Panic. if they'd like to come down. Individually or as a group. Ladies. Good evening. My name is Katie Panock. I'm a fifth grade SCI teacher from the Mary E. Baker School. SCI stands for Sheltered English Immersion. In the near 50 SCI elementary classrooms throughout Brockton, there are students of all language proficiencies, including students who may or may not have attended school in their native country. We as SEI teachers are tasked with preparing these students to eventually be mainstreamed with their grade level peers into general education classrooms. I have been teaching in Brockton for 11 years. This past year, I was forced to teach a split classroom of fourth and fifth grade SEI students because the fourth grade SEI position was eliminated at my school due to budget cuts. This is Katana Blofelder. She has been teaching in Brockton for about four years. Katana was the fourth grade SEI teacher at the Baker, but received a pink slip. This past year, she ended up teaching a split of grade one and two students at the George School. And this is Lizette Baptista. She has been teaching fourth grade SEI for eight years. This past year, she was forced to also teach a split classroom of fourth and fifth grade SEI students. There are two other four or five splits. One is at the Kennedy and the other at the Angelo. Those teachers could not be here tonight, so we are here representing them as well. The reason we are here tonight is to advocate for our students as they are not receiving an equitable education as their grade level peers. And now with the elimination of our SEI Paris, this will be an even greater challenge. We understand all interests are important and everybody is working toward the same goal, but we wanted to talk about the state our split classrooms are in at this point. Here is what SEI splits look like in our classrooms for next year. The Baker uh, has 25 students to start, eight fifth graders and 17 fourth graders. The Davis has 23 students to start, six fifth graders and 17 fourth graders. The George has 24 students to start, and 12 of those are first graders and 12 are second graders. 
Based on previous years, some schools have received six newcomers per classroom throughout the year and sometimes more. In past years, SEI, our numbers have been 13 to 20 students to start in one grade level. Every year, the number of bilingual students has increased. Parents have requested SEI in order to support their children's English proficiency level. Parents at some schools have not been notified in years past about splits, which means it falls on their teachers to explain the classroom situation. Um, out of 375 minutes a day, we are required to provide 100 minutes of math, 100 20 minutes of English language arts per the elementary education requirements in Brockton. So for a 1-2 split or a 4-5 classroom split, it should mean that there are 100 minutes for a 4th grade or 1st grade um, period. There are 100 minutes for math for 2nd or 5th grade uh, period. There are 100 20 minutes for English language arts for first or fourth grade period, and there are 120 minutes of English language arts for a second grade or fifth grade uh, period. This is a total of 440 minutes a day just for math and reading in order to provide the same time on task that general education elementary students receive. Uh, general education classrooms are able to meet these requirements for one grade level. However, with only 375 minutes in the school day, split classrooms are not able to accomplish this. Furthermore, that does not even include infusing science um, into the curriculum. According to these requirements, there are not enough minutes in the day for split classrooms to accomplish and appropriately meet the needs of their students. With this said, our native language speaking paras are vital support to the needs of our students. Um, currently, we are responsible for core curriculum standards for two grades, two regular report cards, two ESL report cards, administering the WIDA access test for the three, two grade levels at three different tiers, uh, two different benchmark tests, and at times our students are missing out having common recess and eating lunch with grade level peers because of the split in the way the time works. Um, and we're still responsible to get our kids ready for state testing in the four or five while being held accountable for their scores. So finally, this past year teaching splits has been very challenging and daily we felt defeated. We do understand that the budget is very tight. However, we were able to utilize our paras to help provide our newcomers with their English language proficiency level instruction as well as providing us with support while teaching two grade levels at once. While we would like to advocate for this if the splits remain is a full-time SEI para because without a para it's going to be much harder to maintain the compliance. We would like to thank you all uh, for your time and we hope you take our concerns into consideration for the upcoming school year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's all we have for hearing the visitors tonight. So we'll move on to our consent agenda. Uh, this is where the school committee is able to handle several pieces of relatively routine business as a block in order to keep the meeting moving along. Uh, however, any member of the committee may request that any individual item here on the consent agenda be removed for individual discussion. So at this time, I'll ask the members of the committee if anyone has an consent agenda item that they would like to uh, remove. Okay, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion on the consent agenda as a whole. Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded to adopt the consent agenda. All in favor? Approved unanimously. Okay, so at this time, uh, I'll turn the meeting over to Superintendent Smith for the report on teaching and learning. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to uh, start again with uh, a couple of items under budget and under advocacy. Uh, last evening at our school committee retreat, uh, we had uh, our attorney uh, come and talk to us about 
what it takes for a uh, Proposition 2.5 override vote. Um, it was very informative. Um, obviously, it, it's a lot of work in formulating a question, uh, information as far as uh, the first year when you put a Prop 2.5 uh, question on a ballot. And again, there are so many days uh, before you put a question there. It has to be approved by City Council, uh, by Mayor. We continue to look into you know, all the different political particulars, but it is something that we are going to at least move forward and explore and continue to, to look as, uh, at the two and a half as far as advocacy. On top of that, um, I do have uh, a meeting set up uh, this coming Monday evening with some other urban superintendents to talk about our equity and education lawsuit. I was very pleased to talk about the $100,000. Uh, again, thank you, Mayor, for keeping that in the budget to move forward on our equity and education lawsuit because, quite honestly, as the Mayor and I start to look at even some of the state figures coming in, it is daunting right now uh, as far as the difficulty in a $16 million budget cut that we have sustained in being able to provide the services that we would like to provide. Uh, I'm very cognizant of um, the feelings in the district and every one of us is feeling not just the pressure but feeling uh, the difficulty in trying to figure out how we move the district forward and we continue to talk about getting through one year. So the advocacy is essential in looking at every single avenue that we can look at to make sure that we're supporting our schools. So I would like to um, ask, for uh, before I get into the budget update, I would like to ask uh, Chief Budget Officer Aldo Petranio to come up as I go through some of the initial figures that we are getting. As you know, the state has finished their budget, but it does go to the governor's uh, desk, so to say, and I believe it's 10 days from the time the governor received the budget as to make any changes. Um, and again, I believe it becomes state law at the end of the process uh, after the 10 days. So we are seeing some initial figures come in. Um, we do have some concerns, and as I said, we're watching it very closely. I know the mayor is going to be setting up a meeting with our chief financial officer, Aldo, myself and the mayor to take a look so that we have a better handle. But there are a couple of things we would like to do at this point. We continue to look at our end of the year reports for June 30th, uh, looking at opportunities for uh, prepaying uh, sped uh, out of uh, district tuitions and ways to move around money so that we can support some of the positions that we need to certainly bring back. So Aldo, do you want to give us a couple of updates on the um, prepay and also some of the figures that you do see coming out? As we're planning on the budget, um, what we do at this point is we're back to charge uh, every grant that we can to fully expend it on those grants and we're sort of freeze the funds. So I'm asking the committee this evening to give you permission to try and uh, prepay another 300000 This is what the mayor gave out. us last we're night. Pre 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 okay, uh, just to have the cheap percent. So I'll go on the law um, to do that. And that is trying to free up 300000 in the FY18 budget, which we can use in order to necessary um, at this point. So any other, as we have discussed, any other available funds that are in there, we have some programs, um, uh, Discovery Ed, um, some of the learning programs that might pre-purchase with those funds, I'll do the same with those also. And at the very end, whenever funds are left, at the very um, end of it, we try to buy laptop cards or tablet cards because every, those that need every single classroom and by FY19, we have to test on those. So um, I will be asking for a motion tonight for that. And about an hour and a half or so ago, I received, I've been checking with the Department of Revenue, because once the budget comes out, they usually break up your figures by city, because the governor puts his uh, package up it's in the hole. So about an hour and a half ago, the Department of Revenue put out the, the, the cherry sheet figures. Now those aren't the detailed figures that we get from the Department of Ed that shows us the exact foundation budget and how they allocated those funds to us, um, because those can still change slightly. But according to what the Department of Revenue put out, it looks like from the governor's budget to the House budget to the Senate budget, they have the conference committee budget, and it looks as though that conference committee budget is only $178,000 over what the governor had proposed in his initial budget. That's not good news. Um, the Senate had us closer to two million over the governor's budget, and it appears we're not going to receive 
receive that amount. We're not going to receive that amount of money at this time. Um, I put a request in to get some more information on this, so I can find out exactly how and why um, the Senate budget. Um, not so much wasn't adopted, but why Brockton didn't fare as well as um, some other communities have with these funds. So um, the governor still can uh, veto line items. There can still be some changes. So I don't know um, when he goes and signs his final budget, whether it'll be for us. I still have questions on the pothole funds that were supposed to be set aside that we hopefully could apply for. At this point, my initial conversation with someone from the Mass Teachers Association was that it appears Brockton's not receiving any of those funds and we're trying to find out why. So. Alder, can you do me a favor, please? Because I want to make sure everyone heard you when you talked at the beginning without the microphone. Could you please repeat the beginning conversation? Sure. So I've, I've, I've been checking with the Department of Revenue because they issue the cherry sheets for every city and town in the state, trying to see where we end up on there. The, the cherry sheet is the gross revenues that come out to the city. So in there is chapter 70 is one of the revenues. So when it came out about an hour and a half or so ago, um, it shows FY17 from last year, it shows the governor's proposed budget, then it shows the house proposed budget, which we saw early in April, then it shows the Senate budget, which we saw sometime in May, and then it shows the conference committee, which is the compromise between the House and the Senate. The problem we have is that there was no real compromise. It looks as though the conference committee gave us the House budget, which is only $178,000 over what the governor proposed to us. That's roughly about $10 per student. The governor had included $20 per student in his budget, and so the House upped it to 30 by giving us $10 more. The problem here is that the Senate had proposed closer to $2 million of an increase for us, and it appears we're not getting that. So that's uh, kind of the dilemma that we're in right now, and we're trying to get answers as to why it is um, that small white Brockton with all our advocacy is not receiving more funds. Can you also go back to the um, pre-purchase? Uh, oh. Yes. And um, the uh, prepay. In, in tying out this year's budget, <laughs> as we as we get to June 30th and beyond, we look to um, pick up as many costs as we can via grants. We don't want to return any grant money, so we look at using up every penny of grant money. In doing so, that frees up local fund money. So with that, um, it's, it, it appears that I can pick up about another $300,000 of special ed tuitions. We're allowed by law to prepay those. So we've already prepaid a million and a half, and I'm asking this committee's permission to prepay a million eight. So that, that 300000 that we prepay will free up 300000 in next year's budget. That 300000 will be available funds that this committee can decide you know, on how best to, uh, to use those funds. So I'll be looking for a motion for that. So at this point here, when we're seeing these figures come through, and as I said, I want to be cautious because we do not have final figures, but we did have some conversation last evening, so we were very disappointed when we started to see some of the figures again come out today. That being said, we're going to continue to do everything we can to build up because as it stands right now, you still have 127 teachers out, you have 94 paraprofessionals, 21 monitor teacher assistants, 9 administrative assistants, 11 custodians, and 1 school police. Uh, position. Those are eliminated positions presently. So there are concerns uh, as we start to try to build back, and that's what we talked about, you know, looking uh, through uh, you know, different avenues this summer to see if there are additional funds you want to build up an account so you can start to look at those positions that you need for compliance. Those were things that were spoken about at the last meeting. Those are bilingual classrooms. Those are special education classrooms. We, last night we looked at class sizes throughout the district. We'll continue to monitor, you know, the class sizes. You saw a number of places where there were freezes and a number of places where there were openings and we're working very hard to try to make sure that students are going to places where we actually have class sizes that are reasonable. So that being said, you know, this 300000 which is on top of, you know, building our uh, prepaying those SPED tuitions, we would like you to vote on to go up from the $1.5 million to $1.8 million and to put that 300000 basically in reserve along with the 88000 that you had previously in there and we'll try to continue to build that up. Whether it's the 178000 I know the mayor continues to look for different avenues, so we, we are continuing to do that. So that is my recommendation at this point. 
Mr. Minichello. If we allocated the additional 300,000, then with regard to the numbers as we see them, and taking into account this additional 178 would be, we'd have approximately 566,000 available for next year? Yes. And does, does this, is this including or excluding any Title I money? Completely excluding. We were told that we should have Title I, Title IIA, Title III, and there's a new Title IV, uh, which is dealing with some social and emotional um, support. So that being said, we are told that we should have those figures by mid-July. Last year, I actually had those figures on July 8th. We are anticipating an increase. The thing that we're being very cautious about is we do have raises for a number of our um, certified staff members that are part of those Title I funds. They do come with restrictions. There are ways that we have to use that money. Title IIA is coaching, curriculum support. Title I, again, is support for the classroom. Title III is bilingual support. So there are mandates. We'll work with our coordinator, Karen McCarthy, um, our uh, directors that oversee Kelly Jones in our bilingual department, and we'll look at those funds when they come in too. They won't necessarily bring back classroom teachers, but there will be opportunities for some teachers that might have been so-called blue slips until we actually have those funds in hand. So you will see some movement once we get those funds uh, actually accounted for in the district. So if, um, when we do get those figures, um, would that then have an impact with respect to uh, monies that we've committed already? So that that money would supplant monies that have been committed, or is that totally separate? Or, or a small portion of it? Right. Title I is supposed to be right. um, non-supplanting. So, yeah. um, that will that won't affect the current budget problems. That's only supposed to be for new programs, new needs. So um, I, I, unless there's a change in, in the way we do some of our programs, I don't see that money um, really offsetting. Okay. No, it, it doesn't offset. There are, it really is support positions in our district. It's, it comes to us, again, uh, under a formula uh, based on census, based on poverty. So again, this is the good news is for this year because you originally, when we started to hear a new administration and at the White House, there was concern about Title IIA. And at least for this year, we're anticipating uh, an increase in Title I, Title IIA, Title III, and as I said, there's an addition, uh, this Title IV, which is new. So when that money comes in, it does not necessarily we help out with, with classroom positions. Um, we would have to sit and we will sit with all departments that are affected by that and talk about the best ways to utilize those funds. In the past, we have used them uh, in different ways with um, your Title I teachers. We're proposing uh, to look at those positions in a different way this year to support our classrooms as much as we can without surplanting. So under the law, there are some mandates as far as how we use that money. So once that money comes in, we will report back to you and we'll make recommendations as to how we plan to use that money. The money that we talk about, the 300000 when you talk about building a so-called reserve fund that you had done previously with the 600000 and you brought back 15 teachers, if you recall, back when we finished the budget process. So our goal right now is to continue to build back that fund as much as we can. We mentioned the 300 tonight, possibly the 178. Again, we don't have any final figures. So we'll continue to build that so you can then make strategic decisions about your teachers. You've got compliance with your bilingual teachers. You have to make sure your special education classes are covered. And then as we looked at those numbers in classrooms last evening, we can be very strategic as to where those large numbers are. For instance, if we look at a particular school where the numbers are close to 30, you might want to add a first grade classroom to that particular school. So we're going to have to, you know, to lessen those numbers. So we'll be very strategic as far as where these positions come in. Uh, can you just, Mr. Petronio, if, if you know roughly off the top of your head, the federal funds that came in last year, how much money was that about? Title, title one, two A, three. What, four million? I think six million in Title One, close to that. I think a million and a half in Title Two. Um, title Three, I don't. 
I don't recall how much that was. Overall, in grants, we receive about $18 million a year. But that's not all Title, that's, title one Title No, that's, two, that's right. all grants. Okay, that's all grants. And so and none of what we've been looking at includes any of that $18 million in grant money? At this point, no. Okay. No, this local our cuts right now that I just mentioned right. are all your local funds. Right. Okay. Any further questions or discussion okay. for Mr. Petronio? But I think we're looking for a motion uh, to request that the superintendent move that three hundred thousand dollars, which will in turn free up three hundred thousand for the new budget. Special ed tuition prepay to an additional three hundred thousand dollars, which would bring it to one point eight million from one point five million. Mm -hmm. That's my motion. Okay. So we've got a motion seconded by Miss Plant. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Opposed? Good. Very good. Thank that's you. It. That's uh, adopted. Thank you. Uh, next is the kindergarten start date. So they. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, ma'am. Sure. Yeah, okay. So while we're still on budget, um, we've identified on the city side at the end of the fiscal year, as I told everyone, we would be searching around to find any funds that might become available. We've identified a total of $280,000 on the city side that I could ask the city council to approve an appropriation over to the schools. Um, we found $180,000 of unexpended funds in an account and at the last minute we asked the City Council to put it in stabilization for the purpose of appropriating it to the schools after July 1st. We also took a $100,000 budget cut in one particular department that we've decided we can live with and use the $100,000 for something else. So there's a total of $280,000. It's not a lot, but we're chipping away at this thing. Um, what I would like is to have some discussion with you in terms of where that money would go if we send it over. I'd like to be able, when I request that appropriation from the council, to be able to tell them what we intend to do with it. Um, and I also, you know, want to, and I don't disagree with anything the superintendent has said, uh, but I'm also hearing from a lot of constituents that are worried about programs that have been cut. I'm hearing from a lot of constituents that are worried about whether their child's going to have a bus or not this year. And so um, the education piece is absolutely our focus, but I'm hoping you might see this as an opportunity to maybe restore a couple programs that we desperately need and or put a little money towards transportation. So um, that for folks know that we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of a five or $600,000 deficit right now, that if we had to make a decision right this second, we'd be forced to push out the walk zones and students would lose busing. So upon that, I'll take uh, any discussions, suggestions, Mr. Minichello. Well, I know with respect to transportation, we're approximately uh, half a million dollars behind. Um, and we had a, you know, we had a, a good meeting with uh, per student. Um, there, there may be some uh, flexibility, but I don't think the flexibility is going to amount to five hundred thousand um, dollars. So I would, I would try to um, do some sort of a, um, a split and basically put uh, a sum of money towards transportation because. Um, you know, it's going to be vital. I mean, we, we've already had incidents of safety with kids, and um, you know, in the past, and it's it's not going to get any better. The streets of Brockton are just out of control with regard to people driving. So I, I think we really need to make sure the kids are safe getting to school. So um, you know, I would recommend that we allocate you know a hundred grand towards busing, and then we talk about. Um, you know, working with uh, you know first student in our transportation department. I know Mr. Thomas was going to look at certain routes to see if there was any doubling up on something on some of the routes that are very close to the uh, high school, so that uh, buses could do a double swing. 
Um, and then, you know, at our retreat, naturally, uh, last night we talked certainly about instruction in classrooms, but we also talked about programs. Um, so with respect to the monies that we just talked about, you know, close to uh, 600000 566 I mean, I, I think I would agree with the superintendent those monies should be earmarked towards instruction, and, you know. But I think with some of this money, you know, it was brought up that the middle schools are getting hit pretty hard, and if those kids don't have anything positive to do, then, you know, we're going to have issues with those students. Um, so I would make a recommendation that we, you know, invest some of that money in the uh, middle school sports program because that encompasses most of the kids that participate at the middle school program, as well as um, uh, we had advocacy here from many parents on that Empower Yourself program at the middle schools. So um, that's something that I think is worthwhile. So um, I'll get right to him just, just a second. Um, I'm just trying to look at some numbers as Mr. Minicello is talking. So, Tom, what are you thinking? Do you have a suggestion of a number? Did I miss a number? Well, I think, you know, 100,000, I would say, towards busing. Right. Um, in terms of we've got 180 yeah. towards I think theoretically programs, if the committee agrees. Uh, I think Empower Yourself is around 45. Is that? It is at all level is 137. Okay. Yeah. So 137 and 45 is 182. So we're talking about there's there's the two basically 280. Yep. So I had ex I know that the amount that we have that I can request an appropriation on right now is exactly 280. So I'd have to make it 98 towards the buses. But I don't think that's the end of the world. It's it's 100,000 down payment on the difference. So, I mean, that's how I, I mean, that's how I think it, it would stretch the most, basically. And, and as Tom kind of alluded to, we're listening to the superintendent loud and clear. I thought it was a very effective presentation on the SCI Paris tonight. Clearly, there's a need there. I am hearing from our different communities in the city regarding what look like disproportionate cuts in bilingual teaching staff and what our obligations are to English language learners. I'm hearing from special ed parents who are concerned about us meeting our obligations with special ed students. You know, we've got a ton of needs here. Um, but I think that if we're setting the 300,000 aside that's just been freed up towards position callbacks theoretically, um, strategic as the superintendent said, uh, I, you know, I, I, I do feel like I'd like to see us try to get a couple programs back and not put our head in the sand about transportation at the same time. So, um, Tom, are you good for right now? Yep. Okay, Mr. D'Agostino. Um, I partially got what I was looking for. 137 for the intramurals and Mr. all levels. Well, okay, so that was my next question. You said at all levels, how much if we were to just look at middle school intramurals? It was 132. Oh, that's the hybrid school. That's separate from Right. Oh, so that was the new hybrid program we did last year. Yeah. And that, okay. All right. But it's something. Right. I didn't know if that was at all levels, so maybe we could reduce that if we were just looking at middle school, but it sounds like that's not. for the basically the middle school hybrid sports no, program. Hundred and thirty two thousand middle school hybrid sports. That was the program we were with the VEA on last year to come okay. up with. That's separate from the regular intramurals program. We that was fully intact with hundred and thirty seven. Right. Yep. And that's an elementary high school. So that's program. two completely separate numbers. Correct. Okay. So thirty two for hybrid on the board is hundred and thirty two for in essence middle school sports. Correct. And that's the after school sports? Yes. Uh, okay. So middle school 
after school sports is 132. Completely separately, intramurals at all levels is 137. And I was looking for the, the number on Empower Yourself. 45,000. 45. 45. 45. I think it had been 50 and we cut it to 45 last year as I recall. Ms. Plant. First of all, I'd like to thank you for, um, for working hard to find some funds that can help us. We're, we're going to keep working all, all the way on and that's what we've been telling everyone all along. We're going to keep working at this thing. Thank you very much. Um, what I would like to suggest is that we discuss how we want to use these funds, perhaps at a finance subcommittee, where we can kind of, I, I do like your idea of how we could use this to maybe assist in the transportation and provide programs that, especially for our middle school students, um, with the hopes that some of the funds we talked about earlier with Mr. Petronio could be used for perhaps bringing back some of our powers, especially our SEI powers. We did discuss how valuable our powers are to us, um, but I would like to be able to perhaps have a sit down to subcommittee meeting where we really kind of get to look at the numbers as opposed to um, really just making a decision right now. Would we have the time to do that? Honestly, I don't think so. Um, I, I'm looking at, um, and we're going to get to this under the next heading, but I, I did reach out to both the superintendent and the vice chair today to, to get their thoughts on perhaps calling a finance meeting for July 25th, two weeks from tonight. Okay. Um, and we we'll, can talk about that in a minute for a lot of the reasons you just spoke about. This 300,000 is being put aside, but I think even more importantly, I think in two weeks we'll have some real numbers to work with from the state. Um, and we don't have that right now. And even though um, I think the outlook is a little bleak, uh, the fact of the matter is we don't really know for sure we don't have actual numbers to work with. And I thought a finance committee meeting on the 25th with a chance to maybe start working with some numbers to prepare for that August regular school committee meeting so that we'd be prepared to hopefully reinstate some positions and et cetera, um, made sense. For me to file the, I have to file the appropriation uh, no later than this coming Tuesday morning if you want it heard at the next city council meeting. And they are, it has to go three readings of the city council. So it's read by the city council, it's then sent to their finance committee, and it's then sent back to the full council. So you're looking at that not getting back to the full council until September sometime if I don't file it before next Tuesday. And that's why I was putting it on the putting it on the table. I mean, I'll defer if we want to wait. I can sit on the money. Um, my thought was to keep looking for more money in the meantime, but see if we could at least show that we're listening to folks and trying to address some of the concerns as we can identify funds that could be available. But I, again, I, I'll defer to the committee as a whole, but I, I was hoping that this 280, we could have a meeting of the minds and get it moving while we also simultaneously schedule a FinCon meeting for 25th, as Ms. Plant said, so that we can work on some stuff in more details. And my feeling is that we'll have numbers by July 25th from the state, because really we're at the state's mercy right now. Mr. D'Agostino. So even though the money hasn't been um, appropriated by the city council yet. You're looking for a, a motion and a vote tonight on what we would do with it? Yes. Okay. Because I think I can make a much stronger case to the, I know the council wants to help, but I think the council's going to have questions on what we plan to do with the money before they send it across the street. And I think it'd be a lot easier conversation uh, to be able to tell the council what the intended purpose of the funds is. Okay. Um, it's just a suggestion. I also can sit and, I mean, that money is not going to go anywhere immediately, so um, it can remain in stabilization and unappropriated funds also. I think in order to make a, an argument for the funds, you have to allocate or identify to the council. That's my opinion. That's the way it's always seemed to work in the past. Um, so to me, um, I think we need to make the motion in order to basically advocate for the cause that we that we basically wanted to be earmarked yeah. for. Um, I would make a motion then to allocate 100000 towards transportation. Um, 
45 to empower yourself and uh, the balance to uh, the middle school sports program. Okay, so the motion is 100,000 to transportation, 45,000 to empower yourself. Um, and did I say something wrong? Oh, hang, hang on just one second. Let me just get the numbers straight <laughs> and then I'll, I'll recognize you. Don't worry. Uh, 145. And so what's the difference the then? One, 135? Yeah. yeah. To middle school sports. So the, the motion on the table right now, properly seconded, is to request a $280,000 appropriation with the intent of applying 100,000 to the transportation deficit, 45,000 to reinstate uh, the Empower Yourself program, and $135,000 towards middle school sports. Now, on the motion, Mr. Wallow. Thank you. Um, I'd like to suggest that we put the middle school sports hybrid model on the back burner and put the intramurals for the entire system um, in there in place of it because I think as we go along moving into the fall we can find money for that that's what my thinking has been um, but you serve a greater number of students with the intramural program and we can we have greater flexibility within the schools to do a very similar thing um, with the hybrid model with just you know with, with less money um, so I think functionally I think it would make more sense to bring back the entire intramural program rather than the just the middle school portion of it because it only serves six to eight. Um, the high school and the elementary school still have intramural programs. Um, it'll give the middle schools an opportunity to kind of maybe work something out between themselves, much like they did last year. Do we have um, just a okay. second? Do we have any? idea what the roughly the participation levels were in those two different programs. We, we had uh, excellent participation in the fall and winter, especially with basketball boys and girls. And is, that, is that the middle school after middle sports school or the intramural? That is the hybrid. That was, uh, That's the hybrid. We had consistent participation in intramurals throughout the entire year. And I know that the high school and middle schools as well adopted along along provide intramurals not only after school but also Sorry, Mr. Gormley, do you all No, done um, here? Okay. I'm done. Okay. So, uh, yeah, well, let me put one idea on the table and then I'll, I'll recognize each of you. What if, just for purposes of tonight, to kind of incorporate a little bit of um, Ms. Plant's earlier suggestion, but allowing us to go forward, uh, what if we considered an amendment to the motion to, to identify 100,000 for transportation, 45,000 for empower yourself, and 135,000 for athletic programming, and then we could tackle it at that July 25th uh, finance meeting. Uh, just a suggestion, so we don't get bogged down, and then we can have a chance to debate that a little further without holding up a formal meeting. The question was an equity question. In terms of the intramural program, the high school, you know, the high school has all, uh, still, uh, you know, all the varsity sports programs and all those activities. They still have the band, right? My, you know, so, so from an equitable standpoint, the middle schools have nothing, right. correct? Nothing. So that's why my concern is, you know, unlike Brett's, which is a you know, valid concern, is, you know, the middle schools have Lugats. Okay, the high school has, you know, the, the sports programs, the band programs, some of the clubs, right? Yes. Clubs? I mean, so. Right. There's no after school There's nothing for the middle school. Right right school. So. As much as we could at the high school. Right, right, right. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just right. saying, from an equity standpoint, that's my concern. You know, okay, we put in intramurals, but. 
you're not putting in much at the middle schools, you know. So that's why I'm thinking I'm focusing more on the middle schools because the high school has a lot of stuff. I would also say that I've heard from a number of parents of, that want their kids to participate in middle school after school sports. I haven't heard from anyone advocating for intramurals for whatever that's I mean, worth. I mean, we can you know put it off, but that's my plan. Are we still cutting music and band programs in our elementary and middle school programs? Are they still at risk right now? Well, what is at risk is some of your instructional programs. Uh, when you talk about music, uh, we were starting in fourth grade. At this point here, that is tied into teachers. You know, so we are looking at you know, delivering music. Our phys ed is something you have to deliver each week to the students. That is mandated by law. So um, it could impact, and that's just your teacher situation could impact impact your instruction, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to start as young as fourth grade. And we discussed how some parents have already been renting instruments for a couple mm -hmm. of years now and they expect those programs to be there when they get to middle school. I have to say I'm pretty frustrated that we were supposed to have a finance subcommittee meeting this evening that has been canceled and here is a conversation that should be happening at a finance subcommittee meeting and it seems we really could have benefited from having that hour to do so. Do we know Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion right this minute? Because I think where we're at is there's actually a motion on the floor that's been properly seconded that we haven't taken action on. So the, the motion that's on the floor is uh, 100,000 for transportation, 45,000. The motion is that the school committee would request an appropriation from uh, the city, from the mayor to file with the city council for $280,000 of funds that have been identified as available on the city side. The school committee's intention would be to allocate 100,000 of that money towards our roughly half a million dollar deficit on transportation, $45,000 to reinstate the Empower Yourself Financial Literacy Program, and 135,000 to reinstate the hybrid middle school sports program that we developed last year. So that's on the floor. It's been properly seconded. So I'm going to put that to a vote. So we'll take a vote on the motion as I just read it. All in favor, please raise your hand. I'm going to cast a vote on this one. So it's five in the affirmative. So that motion carries. Right? Five to three. Thank you. And I guess, Superintendent, now that I've already interrupted you, to follow up on the conversations, we'll have to come back to it later. Can we, uh, is July 25th agreeable for a finance subcommittee meeting two weeks from tonight? Well, the thing that becomes very difficult is we did not anticipate additional monies coming in, and as uh, Aldo said to you, an hour and a half before the meeting. So I think you schedule them every Tuesday going forward because I can't anticipate what's coming, what isn't, um, and again, things are pretty critical. So what I think you do from here on in is uh, put them on for every Tuesday night. And that way there we don't have another school committee meeting till August 8th, I believe. So that way you're covered. And as I said, you know, things are happening very quickly. Um, and that gives us an opportunity to, to meet with those of you and we can have discussion. But that's up to you. But as I said, we had nothing coming in and that was the reason for canceling it. Discussion was going to happen at the meeting this evening about the funds coming from the uh, mayor. The mayor and I spoke about an hour before the meeting, and as I said, Aldo Petronio, Petronio and I were looking at figures, you know, right up until I was leaving the office. So last evening, I was with all of you till 10 o'clock at night, and no, I did not realize that we would have these figures as I told you. We were, you know, no, knew that the uh, money was on the governor's desk, but we weren't really getting any figures at that point. I, for what it's worth, I think it's unlikely that we'll have hard numbers from the state in one week, I think. I think it's at least 10 days, so I, I, I would suggest July 25th for a finance meeting, but I'll, I'll listen to the will of the committee. July 25th, July 18th. July 25th is okay with everybody? We right. discussed this last night. Aldo and I, um, because last night, we said about 10 days from last night, right? Oh, exactly. So and I get told the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Still so, veto. Right. Yeah, right. He can veto and it may end up going back. And yeah. So, 
we'll ask one to then post a uh, finance committee meeting for July 25th. Okay? okay? And Superintendent, I'll turn the floor back over to you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, last evening we also um, started to talk about a discussion we were having in the winter about our kindergarten start date and I want to remind everybody that this has been going on for two years in the district. Two years ago we were giving a, a grant to explore the possibility of preschool in our district. It wasn't a very large grant but it allowed us to talk to community partners to start to look at supporting our youngsters. One of the things that became very clear is our kindergarten start date allows our students to become a five in four months that we call bear babies. So September, October, November, December. And what we looked at when you look at some of the new standards and some of the challenges when we talk about strategically in our plan, it's all our students are reading by age three. Now our students come to us in all different shapes, sizes, uh, different homes, different readiness levels. And when we have done our research in the past year and we presented this to you in January, one of the things that we found were the standards um, were uh, very different for what you would expect what the state calls pre-kindergartners. Those are your older four-year-olds, which would be our bear babies, and your younger five-year-olds. Uh, and the kindergartners are seen with very different standards, everything from literature to um, frameworks for mathematics, and these are curriculum frameworks to social and emotional standards. When we started to look at districts throughout the state, and you're talking over 350 districts, we are one of, and we think at this point, only three districts that allow kindergartners to start when they are four years old. So the discussion took place to, first of all, look at preschool options, and maybe this is an opportunity, and our discussion last evening was to look at this in two phases, especially because we're looking at where we have room, but the one thing we all realized is, had we had them there as kindergartners, we're expecting to have room for the so-called kindergartners. And I want to make it clear that this is not for this September, but we do need to act because before we know it, it'll be January and we will be registering our next group of students for kindergarten. So after a lengthy discussion in both January, uh, again last evening, uh, we are recommending that we actually uh, have a, a multi-year approach to rolling back our kindergarten start age. And Dr. DeBarros presented to us last Last night. We have uh, right now entering in 2017, just to give you an idea of the September, October, November, December birth dates, and it always is pretty close to being almost 100 each month. Presently we have 368 registered, 94 no November babies, 82 December babies, um, and we are recommending in our rollback to move the entrance age to November 1st, starting for this year's registration but in for September of 18. That would allow us to do a half-day program for our so-called preschoolers, and to begin with, we would concentrate on those 200 youngsters. That would allow us to start to investigate preschool. We also had Commissioner Weber here on June 1st talking to us about additional opportunities, additional grants. I want to remind everybody that Springfield, Worcester, and Boston you know, receive additional money for their preschoolers. Now you still get money when you talk about Chapter 70 funding. It would not be a full day program, you would have two half day programs. So you still are getting the money for those students, it would not be a loss in money. So at one point we had talked about ripping off the so-called Band-Aid and going back to September 1st, which is almost where every other district in the state. And when we're looking at our students being competitive, able to achieve benchmarks as they go along, and one of the things that I thought was very interesting in our discussion was Dr. Murray mentioned when he sees the sixth graders come in as 10 year olds. It affects things as far as developmentally, you know, their um, ability to be able to handle a middle school curriculum. And uh, at the time, uh, Sharon Wilder talked to us about the high school and said, can you imagine 13 year olds entering for those four months and dealing with 4,300 students at our high school? So again, this is something, it's a ripple effect. So I am recommending, and we did have a discussion last evening, but I would like to uh, put on the table about our proposed multi-year approach to rolling back our kindergarten age. So it would be two months a year from September? 
correct. In September of 2018, on November and December, students would not be allowed to register for full day kindergarten, right. but we would provide a preschool program for those students. What we would then do for September 19 is pull it back for the September October baby, so to say, um, and we would then have a, a preschool program larger for those 400 students. And again, I can't tell you where we'll be two years from now because we could position ourselves at some point to open it up to four-year-olds, you know, depending on what you have for spacing. But it does allow you to work with our community. I think there's good will come out of this to start to, it's, and things we're already doing, developing curriculum with many of our community providers. We looked at a Springfield model back, uh, I want to say last March, we visited Springfield for two days. And we looked at uh, the city being able to, in Springfield, purchase uh, a school that was going under. It was not a public school at the time. I believe it was a private school. And they were able to make that into a hybrid model preschool where they had some of their um, school department uh, preschool classes and some of their community preschool classes working together, sharing professional development opportunities, operating in the same building. So those approaches allow us to work collaboratively in Brockton. It also gives us time to inform our parents so that they can make preparations and we can start to share information about what we have about being a preschooler now and what's expected of our preschoolers and those are four-year-olds and again our uh, older uh, excuse me our uh, older four-year-olds our younger five-year-olds that are exactly those poor babies and then being able to look at what we expect for kindergarten being a five-year-old and starting in September so I'm more of a rip the band-aid off kind of guy but I think that um, I told them that. Yeah, last okay. Week. It's 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 a plan. So one of the committees I belong to on the U.S. Conference of Mayors is called Cities of Opportunity Task Force. It's chaired by Mayor de Blasio of New York and vice chair by Marty Walsh. And K, the K1, K2 model is something that we've been advocating for for a while. And it's because it's critical to cities that the more kids you've got in poverty, the more kids you've got learning English, um, the more kids you've got with special challenges, getting into that public school seat a year earlier is critical for future success. And so um, I, I support this 100%. I, I'd like to see us. I came on the school committee almost eight years ago. That's when I found out what a bird baby was. I never knew what a bird baby was before then. And we've been talking about it that long. We've been talking about it seven and a half years that I've been here. And I, I just think, I, I don't know how we justify not, this, so, so to me this is a two-step thing. It's first of all, fixing that September 1st date and aligning ourselves with all the school districts around us, which will make our test scores more competitive because you know we're, we're, we're playing with a third of our roster in the minor leagues uh, each year <laughs> as we compete against other um, school districts, their kids at the same grade level that are on average older. Um, so I, I think this first step is to get those first four months, uh, get us back to September 1st. And, and honestly, I'm fine with phasing it in over two years. I think the most important thing is to finally do something. Um, but I'm, my, my hope is that we would continue to maybe two months every year, just keep going until we get to the point that uh, we have a K-1, K-2 model and four-year-olds get to go to public school. Admit it, K-1 is a half-day program, but a K-1, K-2 model. So I, um, I, I support this. So Mayor, can I just say for the committee also, under our proposed action plan, we were seeking school committee approval, number one, assigning responsibilities for the expansion of early childhood education uh, to, again, our administrative staff, to you do not have a, so again, it would be something we would add on to somebody to really start to work with our early childhood task force to develop curriculum, to look at professional development. We'll also start to talk to the community partners 
partners. We need to develop uh, long-range plans as far as facilities. We have an idea right now what we would do with rolling it back in a, a two-phase model um, and continue to develop and implement communication and outreach to our parents. This gives you time to start to have conversations with parents, to talk about our expectations for kids that are entering, whether it be a preschool or a kindergarten class, some of those readiness skills, uh, and also uh, continue to, as I said, share with the Brockton community what we're doing with the students. Any discussion on this before we ask for a motion? Mr. D'Agostino. Um, I just wanted to chime in being that, um, you know, I, I think I'm the only one with a child young enough to be impacted at all by this. And, um, you know, when you look at the curriculum differences. What exactly are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> um, it was a little bit of a slant. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> but, you know, when I look at this, just thinking as a, as a parent and, and for my own son, you know, you look at the curriculum differences and why would you want your child in a program that is developmentally completely inappropriate? I, I wouldn't want to do that to him. Um, but also, I'm glad that we're not just rolling back the date and saying, well, we're moving the date back because kindergarten is not appropriate and offering nothing else. Because I, I agree with you that we need to have another educational opportunity, be it pre-K or going to a K-1, K-2 model. We can work on that, but something for the, that the four-year-old age group um, to, to offer that early education opportunity. So I'm glad that we're doing this. I think we're, I, I agree with the, the uh, two-step approach just because it gives parents who maybe were expecting something different a lot of opportunity to, to be prepared for that. And so. New York City, by the way, has uh, a public school seat for every single four-year-old in New York mm -hmm. City. They have a full K-1, K-2 model. Um, Lisa? I'd just like to say, as an early childhood educator, I'm extremely excited about this. And as you said, um, I would hope that we can expand this program and have preschool for all. I mean, why even stop at four? Wouldn't we love to have public preschool for 2.9 and up? And um, I think we'd really be doing a great service to our, our students, our younger students, and really setting them up for success when they do get into kindergarten. And um, I'm very much in support of this. As I mentioned yesterday, I've, I've known about this program for a very long time because I have a 16-year-old who is a burr baby. And um, I'm lucky that you know she did have the skills and was capable of assimilating and, and doing very well when she started kindergarten. But I also saw as a parent that not all the students in her class did have that and um, I think this is very reasonable I think we're doing it very responsibly um, it's a benefit to our district it's a benefit to our students and I 100% support it okay anyone else before we uh, ask for a motion so I guess what we're looking for for a motion uh, superintendent is uh, for the school committee to adopt the uh, two-year phase in program Correct. to roll back the uh, start date to September 1st over a two-year period, beginning with the next school year. So this year's registration in January would be for September 18th, effective date, September of 2018. I'd, like to, I'd like to motion to um, change our rollback with this two-year phase in um, to be, our students have to be age five by November 1st in the 18-19 year and age five by September 1st in the 1920 school year. Mm -hmm. Okay, motion's been made, seconded by Mr. Sullivan. All in favor? Unanimous and want to put me down for a vote on that one too. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we also had discussion last evening. Dr. DeBarros came and spoke to us about a number of things. Um, as transportation gets tighter, one of the things, and I thank her and her team, they are going to be making some recommendations and coming up with a draft uh, policy for our um, looking at our school assignments. Um, we see frustration with parents, and yet our Parent Information Center continues to do a really good job with trying to give parents their first choice. But we were very clear this year about 
about looking at a struggling transportation budget. You were very clear with me on looking at so-called neighborhood schools. So we are going to work on our policy um, this year and hopefully come up with, as we go into registration again, a policy that, again, looks at so-called neighborhood schools. We don't have the schools of the past where you had little schools built all over the city. Uh, you do have, actually, with your middle school structure right now, you do have middle schools geographically within areas that your students, as a matter of fact, you have some that overlap. So we are going to have to take a look this year, but the first place to do that is looking at your policy and how you, how you assign students and making sure that um, you know, parents understand. The other thing that came up, Mayor, and we want to be clear, we are proud of our district and we want to educate everybody that is a resident of Brockton or that we have uh, other uh, policies. For instance, our teachers are allowed to have their children attend the Brockton Public Schools. And that was important at the time because that shows, again, support for the district that we all know has been an excellent district and a district that we're very proud of the accomplishments. So that being said, um, we do need to make sure that we're educating our students that are in Brockton. Um, and as we look at other districts that, that surround us, they're very careful to make sure students that are attending are our students. So our policies, we need to take a look at. We need to make sure that that is clear. Uh, and at the same time, I told Dr. DeBarros that I would publicly talk about some of the things that we have happening uh, in our parent registration center, which is very busy. Um, there are different hours, office hours, uh, June 26th to the 18th. It includes a Wednesday evening in there um, from 4 to 6.30 p.m. When we get into August 21st through August 31st, closer to school, people realizing they need to register their students. We have Wednesdays and Thursdays with the evenings from 4 to 6.30. And when you get to that so-called Labor Day weekend, we do have dates. For instance, if you come in on Thursday, August 24th, and you fill out all the correct paperwork, everything is done, your student would be able to start on Wednesday, September 6th, which is the first day of school. After that, as the date becomes later, for instance, if you walk in uh, on Friday, uh, excuse me, Friday, September 1st, we're actually closed the offices uh, to process all of the folders at that point. But Thursday, August 31st, your student would not be able to start until Friday, September 8th. So my uh, caution to parents is please get out there. If you need to register your students, get all the proper paperwork done so the folder isn't st sitting over to the side, and make sure that your student can start on time. Now, I will say Dr. DeBellos also said that even if you're registering later, they will do everything they can to get students in as quickly as possible. So um, that is our summer with our Parent Registration Center. And also, um, I do want to mention, as I said, last night we started to look at, across the district, some of those areas with the numbers uh, as tight as they are, meaning eliminated positions. You know, we have uh, class sizes uh, ranging uh, in some areas in kindergarten at the Downey School, very low right now, but it gives us a central, actually, zone where we can put students in. Uh, to, to a high in some class sizes of 32, 33, 28, 29. And those are areas that we're calling red zones, that we're trying to freeze and make sure equitably we are placing students in areas. And again, when we talk about bringing back teaching positions, we will be very strategic as far as uh, looking at where we need to bring back those teachers. Any questions? questions for the superintendent. Okay. And, and I had on the transportation update, but at this point here we're still waiting and as we said we continue to be looking to identify funds before we get out there. I think our goal in there was beginning of August to start to let parents know um, if there are different uh, walkouts, um, what the busing situation is. I know Deputy Superintendent Thomas continues to work with first student. You're continuing to look to identify funds as we talked about this evening. Um, uh, so that is, um, that's our update on transportation. Yeah. And I want to um, finish up with just a couple of items. Um, one thing that I want to make clear, uh, this seems to be, and I spoke to the school committee about it last evening, uh, some correspondence to them. I want to make it clear that when we talk about changes in titles, you know, for instance, we have Sharon Wilder that is coming downtown as our Chief Officer of Student Support Services. Those are all of Dr. Tarasi's previous our responsibilities and we have placed additional responsibilities there. We have 
of a cultural proficiency area that uh, Sharon will be working with our district, looking at the diversity and training of our staff and diversity hiring. So we continue to add additional things. Dr. Tarasi will play a limited role. He is helping our school committee complete our policy manual, which is critical. And as he's been acclaimed our trauma-sensitive schools, he'll continue to work with. And I'm hoping that when I look at some of that Title IV money, that might help us you know, with uh, also starting to increase our trauma-sensitive schools throughout the district, which have been part of our strategic plan. Um, June Sabre McGuire, we've asked her at this point not only to take on K-5, to we've changed the title to Chief Academic Officer, but that is taking on, again, our district. Now, obviously, that's something that she needs time to learn. Our hope is for vertical and horizontal articulation, where we make sure our elementary is speaking to our middle school level and our high school and talking about a continuum of instruction. That will take time, and if nothing else, those are additional duties. There aren't thousands of dollars and additional pay. None of that is happening. That is absolutely false. It is asking your executive team that are left and remaining to take on additional duties. So I just want to clear that up. I understand the frustration out there. We're doing everything we can to get teacher positions back. Those are our priorities. We understand all of the support positions, which have been critical to the success in our district. And we're asking everybody to work together, whether it's advocacy, whether it's looking for additional funding. Um, I'm very pleased when I, I listen tonight to uh, people coming together and continuing to say that we will look for every dollar. Aldo Petronio and I are going before the, um, with the Mass Association of School Superintendents on the 25th of July to speak about a bill with Sonia Chang Dias, which is pushing the governor to look at the Chapter 70 review. So Brockton will be there, we will have a chance to testify, and we will continue to work on the advocacy and the things that I spoke to you about earlier this evening. Um, we also spoke last evening, uh, uh, again, about um, looking into some of the other avenues, so I will keep you updated as we go along. Um, with the things that the City Council and the School Committee have been uh, adamant about, which is your equity and education lawsuit, and looking at the possibility of securing funding for the school. And that is it. Sir? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, items to refer to subcommittee. I think we are you still on this. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sometimes I'm never sure where to jump in with something. That's okay. Agenda you're right, that's four is yours. Um, so I did have a quite another question that I've got that's kind of along the lines of what the superintendent was just uh, talking about, and I've heard this from a few people, so I wanted to ask. We approved a couple of weeks ago um, callbacks of, I believe it was 52 positions. And my understanding is that those folks have not yet been called back. And so they are still on unemployment, many of them, if they haven't accepted other positions elsewhere. What is, what is the reasoning that we're holding off on making those callbacks at this point? Well, we continue to work on, again, making sure when you've got a lot of moving pieces, so you have people that are so-called blue slip. So we're trying to make sure that we are being strategic as far as calling back people, depending on, again, seniority, depending on certification, depending on areas that they can so-called bump back. So we've spent hours and hours with our HR office. Um, you saw a document presented to us from the BEA, which we are responding to, and it will document all of the positions, where the cuts are happening, throughout every level, and we pretty much are getting close to identifying those 52 positions. One of the things that you heard us talk about previously when, when you approved those 52 was we went back and we looked at our high school and made that our priority to start. At the time, Principal Wilder identified out of, I want to say, 48 positions that had been lifted at the high school or were cuts, we identified 30, and it was very strategically done so that they could implement a schedule for those students at that point in time. So we have identified those 30. Dr. Murray looked at our middle school level. We allowed 10 at the middle school level, and that was, again, with seniority, we found that the PLUF and East Middle School, the way that the seniority hit, the numbers at those schools were missing probably 10 teachers. One was 9, one was 10. Our other middle schools were missing about 4 and 5 each. So we again are trying to find equity at our middle schools. You know, this is very difficult to do, but at least that brought us to a point that we could start to tackle you know, the moving around of the positions. And uh, we had approved 12 at your elementary level. That is your 52 positions, which will come back. 
So we're, we're getting very close. We're just not there yet. Um, it's, 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 again, as you said, we can all feel the frustration, but we have to have it right the first time. So I don't want to make a mistake. For everybody, that's important. It's their job. And it's their right seniority-wise to make sure when we're calling back those positions, we're calling back the right people to those positions. So are we a week, two weeks? I was probably within, uh, probably by Friday this week. Today's Tuesday. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Everyone else good now? So items to refer to subcommittee, we have scheduled a finance meeting for July 25th. Does uh, any other member of the committee have an item they'd like to refer to a subcommittee? I think we're all pretty focused on the budget right now. Okay. Uh, new business. Anyone have any new business? Mr. Sullivan. I'd like to mention, I am in the process at this time of arranging a free backpack for elementary students, and those backpacks are going to be for the needy. This program is being run by Ms. Patricia Jackson, who's a Brockton resident. It will be held at the Raymond School, which is on Oak Street, Saturday, October 26th, and Sunday the 27th at 10 a.m. This will be on a first come, first served basis. I have been in touch with the principal, Cal McGrath. She was well on, on board with this and thought it was a great idea with, the, with just the way that this year's budget is going. Uh, the dates have been moved a couple of times. It was going to be uh, September 2nd and 3rd, and then it was discovered that it's Labor Day weekend. So it was moved back now to the 26th and 27th, which is a Saturday and Sunday. Of August? Of August. Okay. And there's, from what I understand, there's 200 backpacks to be given away free to the needy. Okay. I'm sure we'll have a chance to promote that some more before that day comes up. Thank you, Tim. Anyone else on new business? Really? Tom, you sure? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> okay. Well, if there's no other new business, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion is made. Second? Second. All in favor? This meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you very much.